Uh, the, the title that I gave my thoughts this morning is Jung and the Profoundly Personal. And so uh, it seemed probably a good move in old age to uh, make it profoundly personal. Not only about Jung's profoundly personal, but maybe something from my own past. But first I want to quote something from Auden, Wiston Auden, the poet. We are lived by powers we pretend to understand. And that's the whole thing. And the work that Sonu has been doing, the work that Jung did, what that book is, and what Jung spent his life trying to write and make clear, is the pretending to understand, trying to understand the powers. And we are always up against the enormous limitations of the mind and of language in attempting to understand the powers that are living us. And once we, once we enter the realization that we are being lived, we are not the sole agents. The ego is a myth, a figure. I've never met one anywhere, except the word somewhere or another. That all of that is attempts to understand the powers. And this changes the way, uh, the way one imagines what's going on in life and what happens in relationships, what happens in therapy, what happens everywhere else. We are being lived by powers we pretend to understand. Of course, I never understood this, for, still don't fully, but feel it. Uh, and this is June 19, 2010. In June 1961, I was then 35, and I was uh, allowed to go out to Jung's house and pay homage to Jung's body. He was in a separate room, and some of us went out to Kusnacht from Zurich. I remember uh, carrying a lily, one of those huge lilies with white, you know, those exquisite things that you see imaged in psychology and alchemy, and being uh, received beautifully by Frau Lilly Jung, Frau Hörni, uh, Frau Gret Baumann, and we, we sat on the sofa sometimes, different people coming and going, and I looked at photographs from the old days, and we were beautifully received at this time of mourning. So it was probably the second or third day, I don't know exactly. And so I had my moment in the room with the body and paid homage, had my lily. <laughs> and the, the, the message, the meaning that I was given was get out or get on or gets over, something like that, and do my work. Now, after that, uh, interesting that lily because I remember Yolanda Jacobi, a member of that group at that time, brought red roses. I brought the anima image of the lily. You know, I was the young man of 35 who, um, who was anima possessed, possessed by the idea of the soul, the softness, the adulation, the, all of those virtues that the lily was. But the message was, get out, get on, get over, and do my work. And that's, that was the, the crew. So then for, for years and years and years and years, it seems to me, I was doing the work. 
And at the same time, I was undoing the work. And I was living the tension that Sonu Shamdasani spoke of last night, the tension between the public and the private. Now, I have breached that or, or resolved that tension for a moment by telling that story. By telling a story that is public or telling a story in public that is intimately private. And Jung's The Red Book is a book of deep, deep, intimate privateness. So of course there's this tension. What part is public? What part is private? How far do you go with this or with that? Of course, in late life, it's resolved that the whole business becomes what's public and what's private anyway. But, and what difference does it really make? <laughs> we are all scandals. <laughs> but each differently, of course. <laughs> uh, so that, that tension of doing and undoing, the tension between undoing the language that Sonu has been speaking about, these words that obsess our attempt to understand, ego, unconscious, uh, this kind of type and that kind of type, uh, these rational words that are left over from psychology of other periods, psychology of other dimensions, psychologies of other psychologists. Jung's own language was not that. That's what the Red Book, when it came out, was like an enormous turn for me, a revelation that my undoing all these years of trying to work through and re uh, resist this language of opposites. You use the word contraries. Contraries are not opposites. They're necessary to each other. They're co-relative, co-existent. You don't have one without the other. Black and white aren't opposites. They are only opposites if your mind has to think in an Aristotelian way and, and put them into the category of opposites. Otherwise, you can have all sorts of whiteness without thinking about black, and you can have all sorts of blackness without any kind of necessary opposition. There are no white berries. There's no white coal. There's no, you know, I mean, these are necessary, uh, these are mistakes in thinking. And it was that struggle all along that has occupied me. But now with the Red Book, there is the revelation the revelation that the language, the language of psychology is imagistic. It's poetic. It is uh, pre-dialectic, pre-logical. Jung writes uh, those, those sentences that seem sometimes to be forgotten in the psychological types which you mentioned as being so crucial and as the book that I think that's the first book that came out after the beginnings of the experience with Liber, Liber Novus. Yeah, am I right about that? 1921, I think, yeah. He says, image is not a psychic reflection of an external object. It's not because you saw something and then you have an image of it but a concept derived from poetic usage. Poetic usage is the beginning of the right language for psychology, if we're talking about the powers that have us. A fantasy image, and they appear in space and as voice, but are not pathological as such. He writes, and I'll give you even the paragraph numbers, paragraph 722 in psychological types. Imagination is the reproductive or creative activity of the mind in general. 
What does the mind do? It doesn't invent words like ego. It invents imaginative forms, figures, melodies, poetic phrases, moments of insight, intuitions, formula. Imagination is the reproductive or creative activity of the mind in general. Fantasy as imaginative activity is the direct expression of psychic life. What does the psyche do naturally? As a chicken naturally lays an egg, the human psyche fantasizes. That's its primary activity. Our dreams are prior to our thinking. See, this is a way of looking at the world that seems to me to have been realized in Jung's life in the Red Book. That is, the, the, the concession of the mind that goes back to Aristotle but gets reinforced particularly from Descartes onward, the rational mind, the mind that was dominating that 18th century in which Blake and Swedenborg were contraries, that that mind doesn't do the job and that psychology that arises from that mind can't do the job. So, of course, everyone's in therapy because they're using the wrong mind to deal with the psyche. And the therapists are using the wrong mind in dealing with the psyches who are using the wrong mind. The mind is creating s images, fantasies, and that these are living realities that can speak to us they come figured at times, not only, as I say, also a melody is a psychic image. Fantasy as imaginative activity is the direct expression of psychic life. And they are identical with, again Jung's quote, with the flow of psychic energy. So our energy, our emotional vitality, Whichever way it goes, down or up, inward or outward, the psychic energy is actually only one aspect. The other aspect are the fantasy figures and forms. So if you want to get hold of your emotions or know what emotion or feel yourself emo uh, trapped by an emotion, you try to find the image of that emotion which tells you much more about the emotion than simply suffering the emotion itself. It isn't to get out of the emotion, it is to find its form, to find its fantasy, to, to elaborate it further. Identical with the flow of psychic energy. Even more, he says, in psychological types, Paragraph uh, 78, this one. Psyche creates reality every day. The only exp uh, expression I can use for this activity is fantasy. Wow. Psyche creates reality every day. We think there's psychic inner world, and then there's reality. Watch out, don't do that. <laughs> Psychic reality and then reality, hard reality, which is always hard, tough, real, cold, and so on. Well, that reality is a fantasy also. It's only not recognized as a fantasy, and so we call it reality. Whatever we call reality is a fantasy that has got stubborn and blocked and become obscured to the fact of, its, of the flow of psychic energy in it. This opens the whole business. This opens the soul to uh, living, to living. So that, as a line from Saroyan, one of his plays, 
two people meet, and one says to the other, what's the fantasy now, Kitty Duval? That's the, the relationship. What's the fantasy now? Not what happened to you when you were four. That's a fantasy too, what happened to you when you were four. <laughs> now, this, what I'm trying to elaborate, is also that it is profoundly personal. We think the profoundly personal is what happened to us when we were four. The wounds we've suffered, the hopes that were dashed, the relationships that we have or had, the intimacies, the memories, that this is the profoundly personal. But these are the things that happen to everybody. Everyone has been jilted. Everyone has been disappointed. Everyone has, has filled with enthusiasm. These are the profoundly collective experiences. The profoundly personal is the engagement with one's own demons or the visit to hell. And, to, and the, the encounter with the figures that Jung had, this is the most intimate, deep, profound, unexpected, completely surprising, individualized part of life. In other words, the encounter with one's own soul. And the Red Book begins with that. Jung felt he had lost his soul, and was, it was now his job to find it, or to find out where it was or what had happened. This is the profoundly personal. Now, this changes a lot, because the entire realm of psychotherapy for a hundred years has been going down the avenue of the profoundly personal is my personal life, my personal memories, my personal childhood, my personal experiences, my personal, uh, the subjectivism of my, uh, what Freud called the tagus resta, or the personal unconscious, uh, or the repressed. But there is something else that is not collective in that way, and not collective, let's say, that is not common to us all, but is, has some deep individual, a fateful aspect. And this is what Jung was engaged with as I read the Red Book. He was engaged with uncovering what are in the depths of the soul that was given to him and the fate that was given to him. Well, that changes what's important in your life. That changes that these things you're trying to work out in regard to your personal life are really being lived by powers we're trying to understand. And it takes a kind of courageous uh, fiat mihi, let it be done to me, uh, to drop into that. Again, in the profoundly personal in my own case, when I got to Zurich in 1953, um, the terrors of what lurked that I didn't understand or was afraid of seemed to me to be down below. Now, I hadn't read about Jung's descent through a ho the hole that he dug, but I had that feeling that there were things that were gonna come up and get me. And I took to making little paintings of what might be down there because this was encouraged by my analyst. That seemed to be the way you did things. Um, and I recall the, the descent, for in my, in my moment, was uh, into water. I went down deep into the bottom of the sea, and there were a lot of creatures there that were going to grab me and hold me and 
do things and so on. And I had the experience that I could breathe underwater. And that was a revelation. Whatever a revelation is, that seemed a revelation. That I could actually stay in this realm and do things. Talk, uh, ask questions, move around, uh, explore, and breathe underwater. It was that literal and that concrete and that vivid, the being underwater. And yet at the same time, the imagination, the fantasy made it possible to breathe. Now this is just one example of hundreds of examples of this kind of work that Jung invented. Invented because I say he invented it for modern psychology. People have been doing exploratory journeys forever. That's not, and they're recorded in all kinds of ways, in epics, in, in Dante's work, in Blake's work, and all the way back. All sorts of people have done Hildegard von Bingen and so on and so forth. That's not the point. The point is that Jung did something different with it. He devised this partly as a way, as a method, as something that can be recorded carefully and observed with a uh, phenomenological mind. And I say a phenomenological mind rather than an empirical mind because he was not doing experiment only in the sense of let's try this and see what happens. He was allowing the phenomena to speak. And there's a difference between empiricism and phenomenology here because the empiricist is also doing something with what is. And the phenomenologist is, first of all, allowing the phenomenon to have its say and all, um, all thoughts about it, what it should be, how it should work, uh, all the historical information is bracketed out and you're left with simply the way the phenomenon appears. And Jung let the phenomena speak. Now, we need to know here how difficult it is to let them speak. In our culture, we must remember that, uh, let me just, because I do have a note actually. Um, I think it's Mark, the biblical Mark. And you'll be able to tell me. Uh, Jesus doesn't let the, th yeah, Mark 134. Jesus suffered not the devils to speak. Now, do you realize by letting the demons speak, by letting the voices speak, Jung was making a move of demonology, as Carl Jaspers has said, and he was opening, he was immediately being heretical as his pastor said at his funeral, that he was a heretic. <laughs> well, it's very important because the heretics belong within the church. They're not simply heretics. They have a very important role. And so he let the demon speak. Mark 1.34 says, Jesus suffered not the devils to speak. Get thee behind me, Satan. Harrow hell, death wears thy sting. That opening produced a, a, a radical move in the relation of Jung to Christianity. And the voice says at times in the Red Book, the Christianity that he has in, is not, Sona will be able to tell me those passages where the Christianity in the that Jung thought he was a Christian is not the Christianity that he is discovering in the book. Is that more or less? Yeah. Uh, so that he says, and you can see why, because he is allowing other voices, the multitude of voices to speak and to be figured, to be personified, to have as reality as other figures. In the basic fundamental 
Christian way of looking at it, there is only one voice that can speak to you, and that it must be Jesus' voice. So all the others are out of the game. So the images are also voices, and they bring some sort of message from the dead. And that was one of the things I'd love to talk more with you, Sono, about, is who are the dead? Who are the dead in Jung's book? Are they his personal ancestors? Are they the, the dead of Jerusalem from the seven sermons? Who, who are the dead? What is the message of the dead? And what is it in America, what is it in our culture that has so much trouble with the dead? So difficulty. Our president can't even go to the coffins of the dead, a former president, that we have this, this, this tremendous wall between living and death, so that at any cost we must keep the living alive because what's on the other side? No sense, no sense of the permeability of life and death, of the flow of the others, of the voices, of the figures, of the powers into our life every day, of our relation to those on the other side who in the old days, he used to say, welcome, to be welcomed by the ancestors when you die. Received. Instead, there's something, this great unknown, and you die alone, and all these horrors are imagined because there's no sense of the ancestors. And of course, our ancestors are the American Indians who lived in this soil. So, Perhaps our dead, we are cut from the dead by what, by what we have buried. And to go to the dead would bring up all sorts of things we don't want to bring up. But it's a, a, a question that seems to me the dead are the daily encounter with everything that has been left out, buried, burned, drowned, forgotten on purpose, and continues to um, send wafts of little messages through all sorts of small intuitions, hunches, hints, warnings, omens, the little feelings in the stomach that say, no, I don't think I'll do that. I'm not going to pick up the phone on that one. i am let that one go. Those little cautions and warning. Who, who sends those? Who's protecting us every day about not doing this or doing that? Remember Socrates said that it, he was never told by his daimon what to do. He was only cautioned what not to do. Where does that, the what not to do? The moment of holding off, holding back, not, the moment of not. Are those the dead keeping us safe, watching out for us? Today, this book is so enormously, how many thousand, could I have those figures again? What were they? 46,000 in English. 46,000 in English, 10,000. And more languages coming. And more languages coming. Imagine. And another printing. And another printing. We're in the sixth. Imagine. On the bestseller list. Imagine. Imagine. <laughs> it was uh, last week on Law and Order, Criminal Intent if you happen to see. Was that what it's called, criminal intent? If you happen to have seen it, the Red Book was displayed itself, and it was part of a cult. It was, it was uh, inspi inspiring, some, inspiring some, I don't know whether they were vampires or they were... Now, 
Of course, it's been reviewed. You know, we've had meetings like this in New York and Los Angeles and the New York Times and so on and so forth. What is its importance in our culture at this moment? Is what I have been saying about the dead, about the voices, about letting the demons speak, about the deep polytheistic background that has been forgotten, about the depth of the, the profundity of one's personal life and its importance, and the individual search for, not for meaning, but for image, for images. Meanings don't carry you through, but the images are your companions. You can have all the slogans in the world and explanations and understandings, but what carries you through are the voices and figures you live with and can talk with. Is that what's missing? Is that what they call? It's so radically different from anything else in psychology, so radically different from today's cultural milieu of technology, economics, uh, reason, information. You know, when the book for I don't know if I'm going on too long, am I? Okay. Um, when the book, uh, when it was being written around 1915, let's say, just that period, at that time, current in the mind was Blavatsky, surrealism, parapsychology, in, worked on by leading intellects like William James and many others in England, Dadaism, German Expressionism, Joyce. There were com compatible and comparable experiments in other areas. In our time, this book is absolutely freakish because we, have lived, we live in such a narrow, technical, rational, explanatory, causal way of thinking. We have shrunk our, our mindset tremendously since the beginning of the century when this book was not as strange, in my mind, would not have been as strange. After all, Jung wrote his doctoral dissertation in the year two, uh, 1900 on occult phenomena for a medical degree. Think of that in today's medicine. Today's medicine is packed with occult phenomena. <laughs> but so it's the book has, is sort of a necessity. The book is a necessity in our time, and it is recognized on a deep level of the collective psyche. Thank you very much. There's a famous uh, sentence of Joseph Campbell, uh, I'm not referring to follow your bliss, that goes something like this. You know, when you want to locate a quote um, and something you think you know very well, it disappears from memory. From the page, from the book, it's gone. Uh, this is supposedly a trick of Hermes, who is the god who helps you find things suddenly and who helps you forget things suddenly, uh, just as magically, and seems to take over more as you get older. <laughs> anyway, the phrase or the quote says, the gods are not in Greece or in myth books or even in Campbell's books, but are right on the corner of Broadway and 42nd Street waiting for the lights to change. They are facts of everyday life, not merely the glorious and frightening images printed so beautifully in Campbell's massive works, books almost too heavy to lift appropriately, I guess, since Joseph Campbell did much of the heavy lifting that brought so much of the body or the corpus of exotic mythology back into our public discourse. He helped resurrect the gods uh, the facts into the facts of everyday life. 
Now, there's a very old question that has haunted people who are interested in myth, and that is, have the gods truly fled? There was a famous poem by Hölderlin about the gods have fled, and uh, that this in a needy time, in a dürftige Zeit, even should this indeed be a time of need, a time of impoverished soul, does it necessarily follow that therefore the gods have fled? Can they leave the world at all? That's an even more necessary question. If they are the world as the powers within its variety, how can they be separated from it? Are they not the immortality, the athnetos of the world, giving every item of this world its inherent transcendence, its sublime enchantment, imagination, and beauty? That is at once also fearful, cruel, enigmatic, and profoundly ununderstandable. Why has the modern age accepted the thesis that the gods can simply up and go? Certainly their absence, if that is the case, cannot be due to us, to our having deserted their groves and altars and failed their rituals and sacrifices and forgotten their mysteries. Up to us. They surely cannot be that dependent on what we do or not do. If that were the case, how could they claim their suprahuman authority in the cosmos if their presence or absence depends on our behavior regarding them? The gods of myth are really nothing more than what both orthodox religion or secular relativism and rationalism insists, fictions of human fantasy. So the question turns again, who and what benefits from declaring the ancient gods dead or fled? Who wants them gone? And with their absence, all pagan feeling, all pagan style of consciousness gone as well. One thing is sure, both historically and logically, the absence of the gods allows the world to become res extensa, as Descartes called it, a mathematical space calculable in forces, adrift with the litter of soulless objects. All soul, all mind, all consciousness condensed inside the human brain, putting nature at the disposal of the human will. The absence of the gods is not only an efficient secular convenience, an industrialist opportunity for exploitation, a hubristic inflation of mortal humans, much more, the declaration that the gods have fled is also a Christian convenience. Their absence leaves the world open with plenty of room for the presence of Jesus the Savior who gives his redemptive, apocalyptic answer to the needy times. But who needs re who needs redemption, salvation, resurrection? Only the guilty and the dissatisfied. There have been many scholars of religion and history, of myth and literature, of arts and philology, who have intimated the survival of the pagan gods, hidden within the Christian mythos, disguised presences despite their official and evident absence. There have been, as, as well, many who have attempted the revival of the pagan gods by imitations, by invocations, and by interpretations. Myself, I have followed a method that springs from two famous sentences often used by and quoted from C.G. Jung. The first comes supposedly from Delphi, Delphi, it is a saying cut in stone and placed as the lintel over the front door of the house where Jung lived and worked for most of his long life. And the sentence is, called or not called, the God will be present. Vocatus atque non vocatus Deus adoret. The second sentence from Jung, the gods have become diseases. Zeus no longer rules Olympus, but rather the solar plexus, and produces curious specimens for the doctor's consulting room, 
or often not included in this sentence, but from Jung, or disorders the brains of politicians and journalists who unwittingly let loose psychic epidemics in the world. The interiorization of divinity, the move from transcendence to imminence, had already been argued by Spinoza, for which he was banned from the community. The move was further presented by Heinrich Zimmer, the Indologist who said, again famously, all the gods are within. And Heinrich Zimmer was Joseph Campbell's uh, first, let's say, mentor, tutor, uh, to whom he apprenticed. These moves, Jung's, Spinoza's, Zimmer's, are each different and different to Jesus's, the kingdom of God is within you. The differentiation of kinds of imminence is not to our point here, but it is important to recognize the crucial twist that Jung's psychology gave to the imminence of the gods. They have been interiorized into pathology their myths live in our behaviors, irrepressibly demanding recognition and observances. They bear new names borrowed from the textbooks of psychiatry and abnormal psychology. Their refuge no longer the altar and temple phanum, the site of oracle and mystery cult. Instead, they inhabit the interiority of the psyche where they make themselves very present indeed as the powers in the background of the soul's infirmities. Since the repressed returns in the strangely inventive form of symptoms, after all, symptoms are extraordinary inventions, the gods are indeed present, whether invoked or not, right on the corner of 42nd Street. I do need to add that Jung is neither the only nor the first of this, this confluence of the mythological and the pathological, the gods and diseases. Already in 1900, Wilhelm Heinrich Roscher's monograph on Ephialtes, subtitled a, Psycho a, Pathologic subtitled a Pathological Mythological Treatise, interiorized Pan into our nightmares. Concurrent with Roscher, Freud interiorized Oedipus from a theatrical figure we may watch on the stage to a drive in your personal intimate body. As well, Freud elevated the mythical personifications Eros and Thanatos to be the dominant gods of all psychological happenings. It is fashionable today to bypass or surpass Freud for all sorts of reasons, sociological, feminist, scientistic. But one gift from Freud we ought never neglect, his return to the sources of culture in Mediterranean myths rooting psychology not in the brain or genetics or blind evolution, but in the poetic basis of mind, whose imagination is structured by mythical configurations or universali fantastici, as Vico called these archetypal presences. The recognition of the intimate and subtly differentiated connection between myths and pain, between the gods and diseases and politics, is the greatest of all achievements of the Greek mind, singling out that culture from all others, despite its flaws, its faults. That achievement, the Greek perfection of tragedy, which demonstrates directly the mythic governance of human affairs within states, within families, within individuals. Only the Greeks could articulate tragedy to this pitch, and that achievement has not been equaled since. In the Greek sense, we are today in just such a tragedy as Thebes under Oedipus Tyrannos. The king is sick, and in the madness of his sickness, in his profound unconsciousness, the tragedy of the nation lies. Its poverty, its wasted youth, the degeneration of its crops and soil, its water and forests. This was the condition of Thebes at the beginning of Sophocles' first Oedipus play. 
I quote, the city wastes in blight, blight on the earth's fruitful blooms and grazing flocks and on the barren birth pangs of the women. The fever god has fallen on the city and drives it. The fever god in our case today is the same as the one named by Sophocles, line 1911, the fever of the god of war, Ares. And all this because the king is blind to his own nature. In other words, the facts of our collective condi condition must be laid upon the king, as Henry V reluctantly, ambiguously says, upon the king our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. I do not want to overlook the fact that the psychological method I am pursuing, following from Jung and from Campbell, gives scant attention to the historical time frame of the myths, their geographical locations, to the philological analysis of the texts where they are recounted, to the authenticity of their transmission, to the disputed evidence from archaeology, to their sociological and political contexts. In other words, the psychological method I am advancing is shamefacedly syncretistic and may offend the patient devotion to scholarly research by those who come at the same tales with different intentions. To uncover ancient myths and behavior in the phenomena we are unthinkingly absorb as usual reality and utterly unmythical, that is the revelation an archetypal psychology seeks. We ravage the scholarship of others and pilfer whatever we can, justifying these violations in the name of bringing deeper understanding to psychological afflictions. Our method does cast a shadow, a major shadow that wears the bright smile of the new age, its innocent optimism. Besides, our aim of tying a humanness, a human mess to a wider myth, we are also attempting to connect present experience to historical culture, something sadly lacking all through the culture today hoping to open a long closed door bolted from two sides, history and its scholarship bearing witness only to the dead, the past and gone, and psychology utterly contained within the subjective soul, painfully present and personal. Jung and Campbell and those of us here who work in this tradition attempt to show how Western antiquity can be relevant to the life of the psyche and how psychic life can vivify Western antiquity. When scholars speak only to documents and psychologists only to patients, culture languishes, its soul shallow and unrooted in historical knowledge and its knowledge without soul. Let's go back to 42nd Street. Ain't she sweet walking down the street? Behavior, action, myth as it moves along unspoken. Remember the very essence of the word myth is cognate with mien closed as mystery, as the eyelid closes, and simple expletives like mu, Greek for alas, Sanskrit, muka, dumb including also etymological connotations such as mute, mum, mumble, mutter. When we speak myth, we really are not speaking myth, but mythology, the logos or telling of myth. For myth is action, or as some theories say, myth follows from ritual or is embodied in ritual. Moreover, myth gives the certitude of action, such as we easily recognize when possessed by the goddess of sexual love or blinded with martial fever. Just this very idea that myth gives the certitude of action is made clearer by the work of Vico, that extraordinary man and one of my dearest heroes who lived and worked in Naples in the early half of the 18th century and maybe it was the fall he suffered 
at age of seven that cracked his head open and kept him from school for three years that freed him from the science of the time and its education and its ideas of truth, freed him from Newton and Descartes and Galileo and allowed him to found the mind in myth and lay out an, another idea of certitude versus truth. Certitude is the concrete engagement with life and it precedes all the principles and theories and interpretations or the truth that we uh, find for the certitudes. The facts of 42nd Street precede our verification of them in thought or law. We live myth before we declare it to be myth, myth which might only appear in reflection or translate it into a story. The existential engagement is already a certitude, action for itself and in itself, the certitude of immediacy. My urge to fly sunward above it all with Icarus, my unknown union with my mother like Oedipus, my unapproachable distancing intactness like Artemis, my aggressive attack on dirt and bestial monsters like Hercules, the unworried smile and the charming allure I bring to every encounter like Aphrodite. Before verum or truth and all arguments about truth, myths are the ongoing fantasies concurrent with our behaviors, myths enacted in the ceremonies of habitual performance and daily patterns of expression and perception embodied in human behavior. We need to look again at Oedipus. Myth is this certainty or certitude that goes on unthinkingly in each of our actions. And as Isaiah Berlin says when he's talking about Vico, it is myth that gives us the sense of reality. So reality is not the absence of myth or the contrary of myth, it is our immersion in myth is reality. So early in the play, Oedipus the king says, well, I know you are all sick, and in your sickness, none among you as sick as I. Your pain comes to none other than myself. Oedipus Tyrannus the king has taken on the city and its people as himself. He calls them his children, he identifies his condition with theirs. He is the city and its people. We are dealing, however, with something beyond the symbolic significance of kingship and rather with the inter interpenetration of sickness among the polis, the city, the people, and the individual. All are sick together, individuals, community, and government. Private and public cannot be separated. The gods do not affect individuals and families alone or only human beings. They affect the land, the crops, and the herds, and the institutions of state. A city, too, can be pathologized by mythical factors, exactly what Jung said in Wotan in 1936, looking at Germany. The gods live in the polis. <clears throat> the king, whether in Thebes or in Texas, how does a city act when it is sick? What moves do its rulers make? What notions of remedy arise from a sick city? And the play Oedipus gives us answers. First, the sick city calls upon the leader to find remedy, equating the king with the city, Oedipus Tyrannos. The government is responsible. The people are children. Second, the leader calls on Apollo to reveal the cause and the cure. Oedipus says, I sent away unto Apollo's halls to find what I might do or say to save the state. The government turns to Apollonic consciousness, Apollonic means of diagnosis and correction, whether Thebes or Texas. And the government speaks in God's name, quote from the play, 
God proclaimed now to me, for me and God and for our land. Third, the city purges. Oedipus says, quote, I will disperse this filth. Oedipus speaks of purification, expulsion, punishment. He curses those who would not obey him. Quote, I forbid that man, whoever he may be, my land, and I forbid any to welcome him or cry him greeting or make him a sharer in sacrifice or offering to the gods or give him water for his hands to wash. I command all to drive him from their homes since he is our pollution. Fourth, the sick city makes edicts. Oedipus says, I forbid, I command, I invoke this curse. In these early passages of the play, he speaks as the voice of the city. Oedipus, the king, is the state, an utterly public figure. These four solutions, and let me repeat them in brief, a single answer to a complex question. The appeal to Apollo, the language of pollution and expulsion, and apodictic declarations in God's name. These, these supposed solutions are actually manifestations of the city's sickness. They are diagnostic signs. The solutions imagined by a patient for his illness belong to the image of his illness. That is why therapists listen closely to what the patient wants at the beginning of therapy. How the patient imagines remedy and what measures he is already pursuing show how the patient is constellated by his condition. The solutions to the problem of Thebes present the problem of Thebes. The simplistic Apollonic solutions to America's disease are part of the disease itself. The classically ritual solution could only be sacrifice of the king. I have turned to one basic, and sacrifice of the king means more than the capacity to admit a mistake, which even that's missing. I have turned to one basic tragic tale, Sophocles' Oedipus the Tyrant, to expose the myth we are now struggling in. There are others, such as the story the exclusionist followers of Jesus are absorbed by, the story of Armageddon, the final chapter of the Christian Bible, which envisions the final chapter of the planet's life. This archetypal tale is a myth of horror and terror, of flames and plagues, and an avenging Christ's white robe dripping with the blood of his enemies, a myth, too, that gives certitude and belief in it urges action. Whereas it might rather be a self-fulfilling prophecy or an, an, an antiodromia or a revelation of the self-destruction of the Christian Bible at the end of an aeon, we can see. What we can and must learn from Joseph Campbell is that myth is all about us on every street corner. Myth is reality and recognition of this certitude, analysis of the myths at work among us may keep us from falling prey to blind belief and the disasters of delusion. For we are in a collective madness, all of us, even here in this grand Hyatt. Thank you. School with Dr. James Hillman the founder of Archetypal Psychology. Dr. Hillman is internationally known as the champion of psyche, the soul of psychology. Dr. Hillman, hello. Hello. I'm already troubled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already troubled. I don't really like the idea of founder of something. It's so, it's uh, St. Peter on his rock or something. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think I'd rather be a renegade psychologist I don't mind being a champion of psyche. Uh, I think every person is a champion of psyche. 
uh, or at least a representative of psyche. But I, I think it's, it's hard to say what kind of psychologist I am or what archetypal psychology is, so you're in a difficult chair. <laughs> well, I hope between the two of us we'll be able to, to talk a little bit about what archetypal psychology is and, uh, and psyche and the soul. Yeah, I hope so. Another part of that founding is um, a lot of what archetypal psychology does is criticize or bring crit critical sense to things. Mm -hmm. And that's a little different than setting up a whole lot of principles. Yes. It's working with what's already there and trying to rework it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as, as you uh, proposed in revisioning psychology. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Revisioning psychology. Yes. A fortunate title. It was a fortunate title. Yeah. And you're describing this as, as difficult. It's not an easy process to revision uh, something that has become systematized. True. Or that has become uh, believed in very strongly believed in as empirically verified, mm -hmm. uh, then you, you're challenging very deep ideas. Of course, also psychology has set itself up, psychotherapy has set itself up as helping the disturbed, mm -hmm. you know, un, what, do you, what do you call pacifying mm -hmm. or making things secure or mm -hmm. helpful or, 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 you know, it's a progressivist kind of fantasy that mm. things, we, we will make things easier, better, softer, nicer, cope more dealable or copable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the psyche upsets us in order, not, in order for us to go further with our lives and our thoughts. Yes. From reading your work, it sounds like it's quite frequent that psyche upsets <laughs> us in that way <laughs> to help yeah. us to go further. The psyche upsets us. Because that's really the question, isn't it? I mean, a person goes to therapy because of a symptom, mm -hmm. because of a problem, as we call them, or, a, or as an upset, disturbance. Mm -hmm. And the question is how, not so much how to get rid of that as it is, why, why is this disturbance coming mm -hmm. in my life? What does it want? Mm -hmm. What kind of a life have I got that it needs this disturbance? To it. Yes, that really is a, a very different yeah. vision. But I'm wondering, where, how shall we start our, our conversation today? Where are we? Where are we? I mean, we should start with what they call the here and now. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Mm. What, what's psychology worth now? Mm. Look at the world. Look at the USA. Mm. Look at all the people who've taken psychology courses and look at the lack of psychology in our government, in our, in our attitudes, in, I mean, we haven't a clue. Hmm. We go around the world as if uh, there was no such thing as a psyche, no such thing as, as a soul. I mean, we bomb and exploit and take and kill and as if uh, th this had no effect in the, in the soul of, the, of our own people, let alone other people. I, if you ask me, as you did when we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. what's on my mind, I'm mm -hmm. worried about the soul of our own country from the effects of what we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That certainly is on my mind. And when you talk about the soul of our country and, and our soul, tell me what you mean by that. Well, I think I, I mean what people say when they say, when they've heard soul music, mm. or when they have eaten soul food, mm -hmm. or when they address each other as soul brother, soul sister, or, or their partner is their soul mate. Mm -hmm. They know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. The curious thing is, when you try to take what they're talking about, what they sense we're talking about, and translate it into psychology, you lose it. You don't know what, what it is because mm -hmm. you can't define it in rational terms, in the usual, not rational, but mm -hmm. conceptual terms, you know, making a nice 
clean idea of it. Mm -hmm. It's not a clean idea. It's experience. It's something that has to do with the depth of you. Mm -hmm. It has to do with something that matters. It has to do with something to do with love, with connection. Yeah. It's something to do with uh, risk and, and death. Mm -hmm. So those those are those are all involved in that. Also tragedy. You think of soul music, and there's a deep sense of 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 beauty and tragedy together. That's all to do with soul. Mm -hmm. So psychology as a discipline seems to miss that. I think it's afraid of it. Ah. I think it invents mm. boxes, diagnoses, mm. tests, statistics, graphs, <laughs> rules, uh, laws, uh, to keep it away. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little tough on psychology, mm -hmm. but not on soul. And yet, psychology, the word psyche, is the, a soul is the English word for the Greek word psyche. Mm. And psychology should mean the stud, logos, the study of the psyche, the study of the soul. But I don't think mm. psychology is the study of the soul as um, universities present it. The love of war is a love in war of the men for each other. There's a love of war that draws people to go to war, and there's a beauty in war that attracts people, and that's something people don't like to talk about, but we're all fascinated by the sublime terror, or we wouldn't be watching the explosions on TV, or we wouldn't be watching Apocalypse Now and the beginning of that, that fantastic. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. The reports say it again and again and again. I never saw such a beautiful thing in my life as this plane blowing up, as this bomb going off. Nobody wants to hear it, but it's there. The interesting thing for me is how Mars, the god of war, is coupled with Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Why is Mars coupled with Venus? Now, when you like to think in opposites, then you say, well, Mars is ugly and hairy and red and brutal and raging, and Venus is sweet and the oyster shell and the pearls and water, and they're opposites and they take care of each other. But I think there's an innate connection. It's the way of solving the Mars problem. And that's why the military has such extraordinary rituals of beauty. The attraction to the military offers an aesthetic intensity. Parades, music, uniforms, weapons, the love of all that, and the discipline that goes with that calm keeps Mars from being a raging fanatic brute. That's why there is all that chicken in the military. It keeps it in a Venusian form, so you have salutes and mess orders, flags, banners, decorum and all that. And the interesting thing for me, they may march off in a state of euphoria with the bands playing and mothers kissing them goodbye on the railroad tracks, but that's not what keeps them there. The element in common between the different kinds of love would be that one is transported outside of one's usual. The ecstasy can be the highest moment ever experienced, as many battle veterans say. That would make it in common with other kinds of passionate love, sexual love, divine love, mystical love. You become crazy in a way, just as you do in a passionate affair. You become crazy. You do things you should never do. You break the rules, you break the bounds, you're outside of yourself, you find a whole new personality in yourself. Maybe that's a shadow of love. It's not love in that peaceful, mamby-pamby notion of love, turn the other cheek and all that crap. They've tried that for, for how many years? 2,000 years? 
that, that hasn't stopped any wars. One of the interesting things about the, the love of war is that men who come back aren't able to talk about it. Why can't they talk about what it? It's like a mystery. When a, a person went through the mystery cults or a deep religious experience, there was silence. You don't talk about it. It's not only that they experience such horror, but they experience such depth, such terror and such beauty at once. When the men in the Second World War and in the First World War, the American men were asked what they were fighting for, why they were there, the interviews all came out the same way. They were there not because of democracy, not because of protecting the country, but for the other guys. They were there for love of their unit. Vulnerability, the sense that the next one could have my name on it, is certainly important for forming community. Community is so very difficult to form since our society is based on competition. Everybody for himself, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and everybody else is a possible enemy. But in the platoon or in the unit, your life depends on the others, and their life depends on you. When a man sacrifices his life, dies for another man, is for the other. That's the important part that you might call common to all love, the other. The heroic tends to have a tragic ending. Hamlet, these are tragedies, Macbeth, where there's the, a heroic figure, or even whether it's a man or a woman in, in theater, whereas the poor Senex thing has a different tone, which is serious. It can be serious without being tragic. Grave without being tragic. Tragic has something epic and, and, and uh, overwhelming about it. The Greek tragedies in which the gods take place. There's something very serious about the Puer's faithfulness to the work or the vision and the Senex way. It's, it's serious, even if there's foolishness and all these other things that I've mentioned. But serious, to be serious is not the same as to be tragic. Uh, and it is taking the, the vision seriously as as and valuing the, the vision that produces, as you say, an ordeal, or it was said yesterday, the ordeal. But all of that is serious. Life becomes serious, but not necessarily tragic. Tragic's a pretty big thing. And the sadness goes with the Senex what the Senex brings to life, quality of sadness. But do you know what the word sad really means? It means sated. In the Old English, you were sad after eating a meal. You were sated, you were satisfied. And that all goes back to satis in, in Latin, uh, meaning filled. So we're talking still about being filled by one's own uh, process. Yeah. And uh, uh, the French word for pregnant is gravide or grave. So do you see things that are serious are also pregnant and rich and full and so on. 
without, without it being tragic. This uh, talks about the force of character yeah. and the relationship between aging and character. That's the main T point. Tell me, Tell me about that, that relationship. Well, the, the idea there is that as you get older, more and more of your character begins to show. It comes through the cracks. During the middle of your life, you're all caught up in conformity, responsibility. Uh, you have to get the shoes on the kids' feet and pay the mortgage and, and get the car fixed and, you know, do, you have to conform. But when you get old, you can become a character. And so aging is the sine qua non of developing your true I character. think so, or of revealing it. I don't know whether you're developing it, but it's happening to you. It comes through. You find yourself through a whole lot of sudden outbursts of anger, uh, peculiar tastes, uh, strange fantasies, unusual interests, uh, uh, new uh, uh, affections or affiliations. You find yourself becoming more and more of a character. Hmm. Now, you take on a number of both conventional wisdoms and modern practices, among them cosmetic surgery. I think we're seeing an absolute explosion in the, in, the, in the last decade. That, that you, but you make the claim that this has a very deleterious effect on us as a society. I think it does. I think that uh, if there are no faces in the society that represent, that show life as it's experienced, tragedy, uh, inner beauty, grace, dignity, uh, strength of character, strength of emotions, if, the, if there aren't faces that show that, and as Hemingway says, life breaks everyone, and if you can't see those breaks, you're living in a false world. Mm -hmm. So kids or younger people grow up uh, as if they can eliminate, or not as if they can eliminate, but without any models for it. They don't have any faces to see. Who do you see on the, on the media? Who could we look at on the media and say, now there's a face? When we look for faces, now we have to go to ancient cultures, tribal cultures, uh, Native Americans, we, we look back to find faces. A face with character. A face with character. Yeah. Otherwise we find falsified faces that are saying we, she looks wonderful because she's had she's now 60 but she doesn't look it unless you look closely mm -hmm. yeah that's right when you talk about someone looking wonderful yeah. the unstated definition of wonderfulness is they look younger yes. than than, than, they your, look than, than your years why does what does that deprive us of as a society though elders mm -hmm. people who are who they are genuineness authenticity that's a lot. If and then we, we, fail, that. we fail to put values on those things as a consequence. Is that the point you're making? Yeah, I don't even think you put values. I think you sense the values of something mm. authentic. Mm. Now, you also, one of the things that we associate with uh, growing old is a, is a diminished sex life. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you talk about late life eroticism. Right. Tell me about that. And great images, too. Picasso with his, his drawings and his, he, he did this burst of extraordinary pornographic if you want to call them that but they're beautiful images of 300 400 of them in one year mm -hmm. complicated too uh, Whitman in his late life uh, Yeats in his late life they have had bursts of erotic fantasy and it seems to me it, there's more potency and more fertility whether you're man or woman in your imagination in late life which says more about your vitality than your performance but we in north america are all hung up in performance mm -hmm. as opposed to imagination and as opposed and intellectual. to imagine, as opposed to imagination as opposed to the vitality of of feeling yourself alive mm -hmm. and the erotic is part of feeling alive right. it doesn't have to be performed at 90 but it can still fill the mind and the fantasy at 90. We also all seem to fear the deterioration, the physical deterioration yeah. that accompanies of the, course, uh, and the there's no joke. process, the aches and pains and, and the knees know, that don't hair in your yeah, ears. Right. And, uh, what, you know, and, but, and you, you know, you can't see in the half light and you know, the whole business of aging is no joke. But for you, this helps form character or allow that character to come out. I have to ask a question. Why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Is it merely decay of a machine? Is it merely a tree rotting? Or is there something happening in the soul of the person that is 
needs this kind of deterioration for some other kinds of things to come forward, such as waking up at night, which happens more in late life than it does earlier in life. I mean, yes. a kid can sleep right through the night, never yeah. get up once, sleep 12 hours. Yet, yet you say this, in fact, that's almost the foundation of, of your book, is that aging doesn't happen by accident. That's right. There's a purpose to this. I say in the opening sentence, aging is no accident. Right. That's a primary assumption. If you want to take it as an accident, then you can say it's a disease, and then you can try to cure it. And that's what one, one major approach to it is. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's no accident. It belongs to the formation of character. And you need to age. Some people need to age uh, in order for that character really to come forward. Well, let's talk about waking up at yeah. night, because it's well known that, that you, you don't need as much sleep as you grow older, and that you do wake up. Uh, more often, but you're, you're saying that you're not waking up in the night. You're waking up to the night yeah. as you age. Yeah. Explain that. Well, in the middle of your life, you don't have time to wake up to the night. You are so busy. You go to bed late, you catch the late show, you go to sleep, maybe take a sleeping pill so that you're not disturbed. You get up in the morning, sh you know, shake the night off, and go into the day. Your whole life is day-oriented. Right. But 50% of the world is in the dark all the time. 50% of your life is in the night. So by waking up to the night, which happens, then all kinds of strange things come in on you. Dreams, visions, vengeance fantasies, regrets, remorse. It's true. Uh, I mean, you have thoughts in the middle of the night that, that you, you never, never have, have during the day. And you can't even have, and, and also creative ideas. Mm -hmm. You get new ideas in the, at yes. that time. And so you're saying that there's a purpose to I, not sleeping as much. I like to look at it as if there is a purpose. I don't know if there's a purpose. Nobody so that you knows. Can engage these thoughts. And more. that you deepen your character. You've met the fears that the people younger than you are still afraid of and are, are trying to sleep their way through it. Mm -hmm. You meet that stuff between 3 and 5 in the morning. The curious thing is that when dawn comes, it's gone. Yes. They're like demons. They sit on the edge of your bed, and they curse you and give you hell, and then they're gone, but like they're perhaps vampires. But perhaps engaging them is but part of the But engaging them, character. yes, deepens you and makes you face the fears that the other people haven't, and therefore you can be an elder or an ancestor, because mm -hmm. you've met the, the figures, right. the, these, these torturers. And, and they're not only torturers. You do, they do come in with ideas. I get a lot of ideas at that time. Oh, I, you get up stories write, about people I write else. them down. I get, oh, that's a way to deal with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, we're, we're also all familiar with the elderly repeating stories uh, often, again, which we often interpret as just, you know, a function of an increasingly addled brain. That's right. You see that's this right. as something that's quite different. Well, I don't doubt any of the physiology. It's not that. I, I think that the Physiology is true. It is all these things are happening to the brain and to the body. But I like to think there's a sense in it. I try to make some sense of it instead of just taking a pill against it. Mm -hmm. So if the old person starts repeating the same story, what is the, why is it that stories have been repeated through millennia? What is it that's the whole way culture developed through repeated stories before there was writing? There's something about repetition that keeps a culture going. And the old person is almost compelled to tell stories. And then in some ways, short-term memory loss allows that, yeah. that more ancient recollection exactly. of what exactly. has gone past. And clears the out. mind of the daily trivia. Mm -hmm. You know, how to work the newest piece of computer equipment, right. or how to work the ice machine, and you know, all the stuff that you're supposed to keep up with, and all the daily news and the sports results. And that stuff can't be remembered. You don't remember it anymore. Mm -hmm. And instead, this other stuff comes in. To pass on traditions and stories. Pass on traditions and stories. Grandparenting. Stuff. How does that fit into this? Well, grandparents, you know, uh, have short time in front of them. They don't have a lot of life in front of them. But they have so much more time mm -hmm. than the parents. Most curious thing. So they can show the kids another way of living in the world without so much worry. Parents are worried to death about their kids all the time. Mm -hmm. And the newspapers and the media keep, continue to reinforce that. You know, are you a good parent? Are you a bad parent? Have I done enough? Have I played with? Have I given them enough quality time? This constant worry, 
kid will get hurt on the way to school. Uh, 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 it never stops. So the kid learns from the parents worry, goes into the world paranoid. The grandparents, just by the way they live, the old lady walks across the street right through the traffic, you know, and does her shopping, carries the bags home. There's a kind of courage and adventure mm -hmm. for many old people that uh, living alone, uh, facing each day, that doesn't transmit worry, but transmits confidence in, li in life and sees the beauty of, of the day. And that's a big thing for a kid. How could we be a richer society if we changed our views towards aging process? How would we be different? Well, we'd have models of, of older people, and older people would be more active in the society, and younger people, middle-aged people, wouldn't be afraid of getting old. That's the crucial thing. The fear in the middle-aged people, middle-aged, 30, 40, 50, are terrified of getting older because they have no vision and our philosophy, our scientific view of the world has no place for old people, nor does the consumer society. You know, they don't, old people don't consume as much. James Hillman, I want to thank you very much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.